Well, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Nicholas Wheeler, and I'm a professor of international relations uh, at the University of Birmingham and a former director of the ICCS. Uh, and I'm joined this morning by Professor Mark Saunders uh, of the Birmingham Business School. Hello, Mark. Hi. Hello, everybody. Um, we want to begin by thanking Teresa Capellas, uh, the organizer of the third uh, UK Political Psychology Conference, uh, in conjunction with others of uh, for inviting us to uh, present some work in progress uh, that we're developing with colleague uh, Chiara Carvasio. Uh, Chiara can't be with us this morning, unfortunately, or I say this morning, you may be listening to this in different parts of the world. So um, Ki Chiara can't be, can't, can't be with us, um, but, um, but she's contributed to the paper, which is um, we're developing into an article. The topic that we're um, talking about this morning is um, distrust reduction in adversarial relationships. And it very much develops out of work that we've been doing, the three of us, um, on trust and distrust at the University of Birmingham um, over the past few years. What we're going to do in the 10 minutes or so that we've got available um, is talk about some of the key ideas in the paper, drawing on some theoretical work, which Mark has been actively engaged in um, over the years, um, and some of the work that I've been doing and Kiara has been doing um, on the development of trust in international relations, uh, focusing in particular uh, on the challenges of reducing distrust. Now, it's quite common uh, for diplomats and leaders to talk about the challenges of building trust and confidence uh, in interstate relations. Uh, if you look at diplomatic communiques, there's frequent references to the need to build trust and confidence. And research on trust in international relations, which has been developing at some pace in recent years, uh, has focused on the challenges of how to build trust. And there's a lot of discussions and a lot of models uh, of how to think about building trust. But states also often employ, especially I think in recent years, as great power relations have uh, become more and more strained and difficult, the language of distrust. For example, uh, US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo talks in a number of speeches about what he calls the importance of, quote, distrust and verify, end quote, in relation to US uh, engagement with China. And this language of distrust is increasingly, I think, permeating the diplomatic vocabulary uh, and discourse. So what we have become increasingly interested in is the question of the relationship between trust and distrust. And in particular, how can you think about the challenges of building trust uh, if you haven't uh, actually engaged with a process of reducing distrust? And we want to argue that we shouldn't simply see a process of reducing distrust as one uh, of developing trust. Rather, we think it's important to separate out uh, the challenge of dissolving distrust in international relations from then the challenge of building trust. And this is going to be the key focus of our paper. So let me start with some definitions. We're, we're defining trust as, quote, the expectation of no harm in a context where there is always the possibility of betrayal, uh, which is a definition we take from my 2018 book. We're defining distrust as an active belief that another actor cannot be trusted. And we're arguing that trust and distrust are opposites, but they are distinct from each other in terms of their antecedents, their expressions, and their manifestations. And this leads us to make the core claim that the absence of trust is not distrust. And this is gonna be the key focus uh, uh, sustaining this claim uh, in the time that we have available. So, and our starting point then 
is to theorize trust and distrust as separate constructs. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to Mark. Thanks, Nick. If we look at the most basic trust literature, what we see is uh, trust and distrust conceptualized as the same thing with an overlapping range. So if you have high trust, that's the same as low distrust. And if you have low trust, it's the same as high trust. Can we have another click, please, Nick? Yeah. Subsequent to that, this has been developed and seen a, as a continuum where you have a concept which goes from high distrust through a neutral stage, being neither trusting nor distrustful, to high trust. And then most recently, the work has actually moved to conceptualise them as, as follows. Click, please. And they've actually said, as we were, Nick was talking about earlier, trust and distrust has been separate concepts with different dimensions. So what we there see is you can have people who can be highly trusting or lowly trusting, or they can be low distrust and high distrust. And you can be on both scales at the same time. So it's possible to see people who are just high trusting with no distrust, high distrust with no trust, but also a zone of amb ambivalence where they are neither trusting nor distrustful. Now, the work I've been doing in looking at organisations has taken this further to actually try and understand it, and it provides a good basis for what we're now going to be looking at later in terms of with or non-organisational relationships, but in terms of negotiation. So Nick, if you can pass on to the next slide, please. What we've come up with, and this has been published in a variety of journals, including European Journal of Work and Organisational Psychology, is a trust-distrust absence triangle, where we have along the horizontal axis an absence of distrust moving through weak distrust to strong distrust and along the vertical axis an absence of trust moving through weak trust to strong trust. This gives us a variety of different states that the trust or in a relationship can be and remember in most relationships which are dyadic we have both sides are both trustors and trustees they're both on the receipt of trust and actually trust givers. And the crucial thing on here, given our focus on distrust, is to see that people can be just distrusting or they can have an absence of trust and an absence of distrust. In other words, they can inhabit what we would call a zone of ambivalence. And when both parties are in that zone, we have what we would call a zone of mutual ambivalence with neither party trusting nor distrustful. Now, with the next slide, we can see theoretically how this might pan out. And this, this provides some data taken from work with organisations. And what we see is that the how people talk about their feelings of trust and distrust in relation to a relationship depend dif, differ between when they're feeling trust, when they're feeling ambivalence, and when they're feeling distrust. When we look at distrust, we see they express this in terms of feeling cynical, and sceptical and it's manifest in their hesitant behaviour and then being wary and watchful. When we look at trust we see it they express this in terms of feeling confident, feeling assured and feeling hopeful and it's manifest in them taking initiative and as they become strongly trusting being very assured in how they take this forward. The issue with here, which is interesting, is that the importance of these changes in terms of trust and also distrust, but they differ between distrust and trust, and the change starts to occur when they move into the zone of ambivalence with an absence of both trust and distrust. Next slide, please. So if we look at this theoretically, what we have is our trust, distrust, absence triangle. And along the distrust side, we have trust be, distrust being caused by an inherent bad faith model and peaceful self images. And this we will argue, or Nick will argue subsequently, is reduced, the distrust is reduced by security dilemma sensibility, allowing 
the party can, to move to the zone of ambivalence. Obviously, when both parties move to the zone of ambivalence, this actually starts to allow for social bonding to occur and for trust to be built. Nick, over to you. Thanks, Mark. So we see two fundamental drivers of distrust in international relations. Uh, the first one uh, we call peaceful defensive self-images. The fundamental problem here is that decision makers fail to understand that adversaries do not see them as they see themselves. We've got a quote here from Caspar Weinberger. They, the Soviet Union, know perfectly well that we will never launch a first strike. But of course, Soviet decision makers had no such assurances in the early 1980s. Far from it. They believed that the United States had hostile intent towards them. But because the US believed that Soviet decision makers knew that the US harbored no such intentions, then they imputed malign intent to Soviet behavior. If both sides adopt peaceful defensive self images, and we see these so called security dilemma dynamics operating in many relate adversarial relationships um, at the global level, then this creates distrust on both sides. The second driver of distrust is what Ol Holsty called an inherent. This is a belief on the part of decision makers that another state has malign intent and is beyond policies of reassurance. This idea that decision makers operate with a bad faith model emphasizes the dispositional over the situational. Negative behavior is caused by inherent traits, whereas positive behavior is explained by situational pressures. Now it's clear to see that if decision makers are operating with peaceful defensive self images and inherent bad faith models, then they are clearly not in a zone of ambivalence. And so the challenge of distrust reduction is to move to that zone of mutual ambil ambivalence that Mark was talking about. And we argue that the key mechanism for doing that is security dilemma sensibility. The concept of security dilemma sensibility was first developed by uh, Ken Booth and myself in a book that we wrote in 2008 called The Security Dilemma. It refers to an actor's intention and capacity to perceive the motives behind and to show responsiveness towards the potential complexity of the military intentions of others. In particular, it refers to the ability to understand the role that fear might play in their attitudes and behavior, including crucially the role that one's own actions may play in provoking that fear. Now, the concept of security dilemma sensibility, as it was first developed and as people have subsequently worked with the idea, has tended to focus on it as a binary. Actors either possess security dilemma sensibility or they don't. But in recent work with Marcus Holmes, we've argued that it's important to think about an actor's intention and capacity to exercise security dilemma sensibility in terms of the strength of the actor's capacity and intention to exercise it. So to see security dilemma sensibility as, as a variable that alters. And also to recognize that the extent to which another actor in, in a dyadic relationship believes that the other party possesses security dilemma sensibility or is open to developing it is a cru crucial aspect of understanding this. So we want to argue that distrust reduction is fundamentally about both sides coming to know that the other side shares security dilemma sensibility. And we argue that at this point where two actors share an understanding of security dilemma sensibility, recognize how their own actions have made the other fearful and insecure and look to ways to reassure the other. We argue that at that point, actors will have entered a zone of mutual ambivalence. And as Mark 
was arguing, this then opens up the space for the development of trust. Trust is not guaranteed from this position, but the possibility opens up then for trust to develop. And building on existing work that I've been doing and others, we want to argue that trust develops out of a process of social bonding. And so the trust building process cannot develop, cannot begin until actors have journeyed through the distrust reduction process. Now, we propose to illustrate and uh, support our argument with regard to a detailed case study uh, that Kiara has been working on in her PhD, looking at the de-escalation of the Sino-Indian crisis in the late 1980s. And time precludes a fuller discussion of this, but we'll argue that the two sides were able through the exercise of SDS and to arrive at a zone of mutual ambivalence where the strong distrust that characterized the crisis in 1986, the Sino-Indian border uh, dispute, which was, was great risk of military escalation. They we'll argue that the strong distrust at the beginning of the crisis uh, was uh, significantly reduced and uh, dissolved uh, through the uh, exercise of security dilemma sensibility on the part of the two sides. And as a consequence of this, as a consequence of being in this zone of mutual ambivalence, uh, Rajiv Gandhi, the Indian leader, and Deng Xiaoping, the Chinese leader, uh, were able to meet for a face-to-face -face summit and it was through that summary that there was the beginnings of the development of social bonds and trust that allowed for the de-escalation of the crisis. We think this opens up uh, a really important research agenda that, that goes way beyond this particular case in terms of thinking about distrust reduction in international relations. And we think that, it, that it's very important to begin to theorize the conditions not only under which distrust develops uh, in international relations and the drivers of distrust in the way that we've talked about, but also the possibilities for reducing distrust as a critical precondition for the development of trust building. We look forward to discussing our ideas with you in the, uh, in the round table uh, next week. And for now, uh, thank you very much for your time and attention. Mark, would you have anything you'd like to add? Thank you very much indeed for listening. And we think we're onto something really exciting here, which actually should enable us to understand better what's going on. So and we really welcome your comments and insights. Thank you. I think it's the little dot square. Click on the square.